on Kauai and and um, you know none of this work that I'm about to present would, would be possible without them um, so I just I'll shout them out again but um, just keep that in mind that's a lot of us working together um, so today I'm going to be talking about kind of the history of uh, forest birds and the Hawaiian Islands um, why they're so important um, and the current threats and what we're doing to prevent them from going extinct. So first I'm gonna talk about the biodiversity of the Hawaiian Islands in general. Um, and I think that's a good starting point to understand how unique these beautiful honey creepers are. Here's a, an Akikiki is what it's called. Uh, a lot of the bird names are um, named after the sound that the bird makes. And so this one kind of goes Akikiki, um, which I think is pretty cool as some of the Hawaiian names. Um, and the first thing to know is that Hawaiian Islands are one of the most isolated places on earth. Um, the nearest other like major island are the Marquesas, um, which are 1800 miles away. And that's where the Polynesians who settled um, Hawaii came from. Um, and the nearest actual continent is North America, 2,500 miles away. Um, so it's pretty incredible how anything could get here at all. Um, and so life did actually manage to colonize the Hawaiian Islands, believe it or not. And there are three W's that people um, use to describe the three methods. Um, and normally I'd ask for maybe some guesses as to what those are, but since it's kind of a hybrid, I'll just go ahead with the first one and you guys can guess in your head. The first one is water. Um, so water currents um, can carry aquatic plants, things that get um, that float, like um, coconuts, for example, um, things that latch on to like seal fur and other marine mammals were the first things to colonize. Um, and, you know, this could be a variety of things, usually um, marine mammals and plants. Um, and so the next one we got here is wind. Um, that carries more seeds. It can also um, blow birds off course. And that's the main reason why there's uh, a lot of bird species on the Hawaiian Islands. And then um, the last one is wings. So you've got more plant species that latch onto birds. And of course there are birds who just pass through the Hawaiian Islands all the time um, and then stop over on continents. And so there's a lot of species brought from areas with climates much different than Hawaii as well, which is interesting. Um, and so it's important, I think, considering the ecology of the Hawaiian Islands, to think about what could have arrived there. Um, like for example, bats, Spoiler, bats and marine mammals are the only mammals native to Hawaii um, and what couldn't like, you know, grazers and things like that who couldn't swim hundreds of thousands of miles. Um, and so the Hawaiian Islands, just a bit of background on how they're formed um, is there's a hot spot, which is just when there's like a little break in the crust where magma shoots through into the ocean. And eventually that magma cools and forms into lava rock and it'll keep doing that until it forms a mountain above um, water. And actually the, like the, the tallest mountain from base to height, um, if you count underwater is an Everest, it's actually in the ocean. Um, and they started um, way over, I don't know if you can see my cursor with Niihau. Um, on this island, that's the, the oldest and most eroded Hawaiian island. So it started here in the plate. Um, the plate shifted this way. Um, and so soon Hawaii, which is the most recent island, actually still has an active volcano. It's going to look something like this. And so we, here on Kauai, it's um, a pretty old island with a lot of erosion and a lot of you know jungles and things like that. And that's going to impact the bird species. Um, it's about 5 million years old, in fact. Um, and so this kind of illustrates that. And in the next slide here, you can see um, the direction of the trade winds. And that's really important because that brings all the moisture to the islands. So all the islands have a windward and a leeward side. Leeward side would be down here. Um, and that's going to cause 
the mountains to trap a lot of moisture and become very forested um, and jungly in the western side is going to be um, a lot drier and hotter, which leads to a variety of different habitats um, and a lot of different niches for those. Um, and within those habitats, different plant species, different environments. Um, and that's going to lead eventually to a really high level of biodiversity. Um, so you've got a long undisturbed period, um, a lot of time, a lot of isolation. Um, there's no um, genes coming in aside from um, things that occasionally land here and manage to survive. And then you've got um, species that you know, get stuck here. And so that's going to lead to a really high level of biodiversity. Um, and so this just illustrates the habitat type. So this actually is on this uh, snowy mountain is Mauna Kea on Hawaii Island. Um, it's actually a fun fact. You can um, go skiing and surfing on the same day in Hawaii and bring snow back down with you on certain times of year. This is Kauai, um, the beautiful jungle mountains and streams that we have here. And that's a little bit of a drier forested area. Um, so back to the organisms, um, the reason that there's going to be so much biodiversity is a thing called adaptive radiation. And the way I kind of like to describe this, if you're not familiar with genetics, is like the Lord of the Flies. If you've read that book where um, all the kids um, crash land on an island and they're all pretty much good at the same thing. They're, all, they're pretty much good at making fun of each other and being kids. Um, but they each um, kind of diversify and find their own jobs. Um, obviously, it's not the whole summary of the book, but um, they each develop different jobs and they might not be very good at those if you take the entire world, but they're the best on the island at doing those because there's no one else there. Oops, sorry. And there's a lot of things to be done. Um, and that's kind of what happens with adaptive radiation. So like one spider species diversifies into 60 because they all can't do the same thing. So there's a lot of pressure on them to learn how to do different things. So through evolution, um, they each um, radiate into like 60 different species, for example, in less than 5 million years. It's a process that happens really fast. And um, one of the best examples of this is the honey creeper radiation. Um, for reference, Darwin's finches on the Galapagos are another example of this, but there's only 18 species of those. And there's at least 50 honey creeper species that came from one rosy finch population um, right here that came from Asia. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Think about um, the number of diversity that you can get in such a short period of time. And they, of course, developed all kinds of different feeding strategies. And that's kind of one of the things that sets them apart. And since there's no um, genes of rosy finches constantly coming to the island because it was such a freak accident they got there in the first place they are free to just evolve into many different things um so now i want to talk a little bit about the specific birds on Kauai and their threats um because that was really central to what kfbrp actually does so um the birds, one of the things that makes them both magnificent and vulnerable is their specialization through coevolution. So you see the Slobelia flower is the exact same shape as the Amakihi bill um, because the Amakihi, uh, the Kauai Amakihi, um, how that works is it evolves a slightly, long, well, a slightly longer bill to reach the nectar and the flower, um, but then the flower um, only reproduces because it, the pollen gets stuck to the bird face. Um, and so it grows a longer flower um, to force the amakihi to stick its face way in and get covered in pollen. And so they just keep doing that and you get this really cool bill and flower morphology. Um, and so you can see kind of the other strange and wonderful bills of other honey creepers. And this also in turn makes the birds extremely important to the environment um, because a lot of these flowers, since they co-evolve with the birds are completely dependent on those birds to spread um, and to fertilize other plants. And without them, they'll disappear from the forest as well and eventually collapse the forest ecosystem. 
Um, and they're on top of both the uh, um, ecological and just the innate value of these birds, they also have an extreme cultural importance. Um, the Ali'i wore headdresses and robes, feather, and um, they're often, the birds are seen as messengers um, of the gods. And Hawaiians understood how important the birds were for us health. And so they actually, when they caught birds, instead of killing them and taking all their feathers, they devised a way to use sap, sap and bait, stick them to a tree, and they would just pluck a few feathers and let them go. Um, and so they, they managed uh, in some ways to coexist with um, these birds and they have really strong cultural importance. Um, and so honey creepers weren't the only things. There was also a ton of um, waterfowl that landed and got here and there were no grazers to compete with, no pigs or cows or anything. And so they sometimes lost the ability to fly, sometimes didn't, but they just became pretty much grass eaters and small plant eaters. Um, and unfortunately, this wasn't a good decision when for when humans arrived, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but this is kind of the first example of how we can lose a lot of biodiversity in a short amount of time because of humans. So the Polynesians got there and of course they were, you know, they were in tune with their environment and they managed to live sustainable, sustainably in a lot of ways. But when they first came, they inevitably brought diseases that um, infected wildlife. They brought rats and pigs for food and other purposes that began to um, have negative effects on the native wildlife. And then they um, also hunted and gathered. And so they ended up killing a lot of those like defenseless um, grazing birds for food because they just landed on a new island. They didn't really know their way around and needed to survive. Um, and so this outlines um, some of those, and I'll talk a little bit later about this, but the rats, for example, eat the eggs and the birds and the pigs um, destroy plants and spread invasive species. And they can also um, kill the birds directly. Um, and so out of those remaining, out of those um, grazing waterfowl that I was talking about, only the Nene exists. The rest of them are unfortunately extinct. Um, and then it doesn't really stop there because the Europeans arrived on Hawaii and um, on a much greater scale, um, even so 1778 AD, that's after um, the US, obviously, you know, American, you gotta throw that reference in there, the US um, was founded. And so this is very recently um, colonized by um, Europeans, but they were able to do things like create sugar plantations that um, eroded and deprived the soil of nutrients and, you know, resorts and buildings and things like that, um, replaced a lot of the dry forests on the island and other ecosystems. Um, and that led to a lot of extinction as well. In fact, the birds used to be all forested or used to exist all the way down to the coast because the forests did as well. They also brought invasive plants. So these strawberry guava right here. Um, the reason it all looks so homogenous in most of this area is because that's all strawberry guava. Um, and then the kihili ginger is another species. And that well, those were both brought by um, Europeans. The kihili ginger is actually brought by a single botanist who planted one in their yard when they were studying Hawaiian plants and then it got out. And now we have ginger everywhere. Um, but these are really bad because they um, outcompete and kill native plant species and then the birds who rely on the plant species also die for that reason. And they also make the forest structure not very good for nest and building and things like that. Um, the Norway rat and the European swine, um, I kind of described some of those impacts. Um, but the other thing about the swine is that they dig wallows in the ground um, and those create pools of standing water. And that allows another lovely um, visitor that's invaded Hawaii that came on European boats, the mosquito, to um, to breed way up in the mountains at a much higher rate than it would otherwise. Um, and so the mosquito is probably the largest threat to birds because it spreads avian malaria and avian pox, malaria being um, a lot worse. And since 
Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with um, the story of how smallpox, when it came from Europe to America, um, had such a big impact on the native population. Well, it's basically the same thing with avian malaria here. Uh, a bird can get bit by a mosquito and die 24 hours later um, from this parasite. Um, so it's really important to get that under control if there's um, any real hope of saving the birds. Uh, and then lastly, uh, oops, stochastic events. So you got hurricanes like Hurricane Niki that left Kauai without power for 10 days. Uh, and that can roll through and destroy a bunch of nests. And so when you already have a fragile population, you're in trouble. And hurricanes and other natural disasters are only going to get worse um, because of climate change. Uh, and so kind of all these things combine together to um, cause all these birds like the, the OO, um, which is actually extinct so recently that there are people who can still remember hearing and seeing OO in the forest all the time um, to just go extinct um, basically forever. And so um, we want to prevent that and we want to get the forest to a place where we can hear the honey creepers echoing through the, the trees again and see like the red and yellows and blacks starting back and forth. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that we're always working toward. Unfortunately, Hawaii has turned from the uh, biodiversity hotspot to the extinction capital of the world. Um, of 113 endemic land birds, only three dozen remain, two dozen of which are endangered. Eight species in 2021 were declared um, officially extinct. Uh, even though they probably went extinct earlier, um, and three more on other Pacific islands. However, we still have uh, a bunch of great birds left. Um, these three on top here, federally endangered, and then other ones um, are doing better, but uh, the EEV, for example, is also declining a lot. It's just that it's more abundant on other islands. So. Um, we want to protect those as much as we can as well. And most of these are hunting creepers, but we do have the poiope, which is a thrush, um, and the elepio, the flycatcher. So the first is the apopane. I'll just give you a little brief introduction to all the birds. Um, nectar eater, a lot of different um, species of flower that it can feast on, including the ohia, oh, ohia lehua. Um, it is actually doing um, the best out of all the forest birds, maybe because it can feed on more species and also because it's more resistant to malaria. Um, but this is one of those nice bright red birds. It's got gray and black um, in the back, as you can see here. So pretty distinctive. Um, and the next one is the EEV. I like this one actually other than its appearance for its call because it sounds like, you know, kind of ethereal and um, you know, almost electronic in a way. It's really cool. And so this one is obviously the poster child for Hawaiian honey creepers, uh, eats lehua and these little elias and other species. Um, and it's an important pollinator that's declining a lot in Kauai. You have the Kauai amakihi. So there's actually, um, because the first honey creepers actually landed on the Hawaiian Islands before they were all formed. You have um, certain birds like the amakihi that have different species on different islands. Um, so this is the Kauai amakihi, um, and they can feed on a lot of different things. And they've also potentially shown some resistance to malaria, um, but they are um, still declining partially because they only nest in ohia trees. So there's a fungus called rapid ohia death that a lot of our partners are working on. And if that gets a foothold in Hawaii and knocks out a lot of these trees, then uh, Makihi could be in big trouble. Uh, we got the Ani Ani Ao. I like this one. It's one of the smallest um, honey creepers, actually the smallest on the Hawaiian Islands. And it's so light that you can mail it in a, uh, in a letter to someone and not be charged extra postage. Um, which is kind of funny. And this guy is also pretty curious. Sometimes it'll um, land on a branch and just kind of inspect you. It, um, primarily nectivorous, but can also take insects. Um, and then the AKK is one of the ones that we're most worried about, very endangered. Um, this one on Akikiki experienced incredible decline in a short period of time that people weren't really ready for, which is 
um, part of the reason for a lot of the things our project is doing. But this one, it's not giving you a face, but it actually is a cross bill. Um, so that bill is speci specifically designed to open the buds uh, and look for insects and things like that. Um, it was federally listed in 2010, but now there's currently less than a thousand remaining. We got the Akiki also. This is the most endangered one. It's insectivorous. And uh, um, so this one has a little bit of a different lifestyle than Akiki. It kind of flies around in the middle canopy in the branches um, rather than the Akiki that sticks to the treetops. Um, which makes Akake actually a lot harder to find because you'll see it for a minute and then it'll just fly like 500 meters and you won't be able to chase it through the jungle. Um, this one has been a little bit easier to see, but unfortunately um, it's declined so much that um, there's only, there was only one recorded female until recently when our crews this week have discovered a couple more Akikiki. And so we know of at least a few that are still out there, which is great, but it's rapidly going extinct, unfortunately. So we're doing a big project to find the rest of them the past couple of years. Uh, we got the Puaiohi also. Uh, this is the thrush. It nests in cave walls, actually, which is pretty cool. Occasionally in treetops, like you can see in the middle picture on the Olapa, but mostly in the cave walls. And that makes it um, very, um, what's the word? Rats target it a lot more. I forgot the word, but um, susceptible, that's what it is. They'll run up there and eat the nests, um, the birds and the eggs and everything. Um, but this one's also a really beautiful call, and there's only around 500 left. And then the LA Pio, this one's also doing really well, actually. It's a general insectivore, and this one is the most curious of them all. Surprisingly, it'll, this one will follow us around in the forest. It has a great little personality. Um, so now that you've been introduced to all the birds, I'll give you a rundown of the biggest threats to them um, in more detail. So climate change and mosquitoes kind of combine um, and to make the biggest threat. And that's the reason why these birds are only found in one remote section high in the mountains of Kauai. So this basically illustrates that mosquitoes have a certain elevation that they can breed at. Above that elevation, it's too cold in the winter and they'll all die and they, they can't make it up there. Um, so on the left the mountain here, this is more like Hawaii Island where that, that green range is like, you know, um, up to the top, that's where birds can be and eventually get so high that even the birds can't last. Hawaii is more like the one on the right. Um, and the mosquito line right now is that dashed line that's really close to the top. And climate change is warming the island and so it's changing the zones to make the green go higher but also the mosquito line go higher and so eventually get to the point here where the mosquito line overlaps with or like it, it gets to the top of the island and then um, they can have free reign and infect all the birds um, so it's eventually it's going to get there and so it's a matter of controlling the insects before climate change allows them to be able to breed everywhere. And so here we've done a lot of mosquito monitoring. We found the biggest populations. Um, the ones, so on the right side, the east side, are primarily um, mosquitoes that we found that have been probably just blown up by storms or something from the mountains. And their big breeding populations are down here, a little bit lower elevation. Um, but they've invaded all um, bird habitat to some extent already, which is why we're seeing these declines. And like I said before, original distribution um, was here, but now the current range of all eight of those forest birds are restricted to the Alakai in this weird little shape right here. Alakai swamp, that is. So the future, if we do nothing, a lot of these birds are gonna go extinct and their range is gonna drop even more um, by 2100. So, we got to do something about this. And the first thing that they did was to determine the schedule. How long do we have to do something about these birds? Because that's going to inform what kind of strategies we can take. Um, and so they did a lot of, they got all the experts together. They got all the survey data and thought about the other environmental and mosquito data. And they came up with these schedules for how the Akikiki and the Akake are really close to being extinct. And the thing with Akiki is 
um, the most likely scenario is almost accurate. It's it's basically happening. Um, and so we've we've decided that there was very little time to do something. Um, we got alarm bells going. Um, and so we have, and so the by we I mean um, all these conservation organizations between federal groups and nonprofits and university and everyone, they developed in situ and ex situ management. So the in situ would be in the natural environment with vegetation management, um, predator suppression, and mosquito suppression. And then ex situ is actually taking birds out. Uh, we're working with San Diego Zoo to do that and raising them in a safe place and also moving them to potentially other islands that have um, safer habitat. So N Nature Conservancy does a great job with ungulate solution. They had that um, just by fencing off um, pigs and deer from these remote areas in the swamp. And that prevents them from tracking in native or invasive species and also creating mosquito breeding habitat where the birds are. Um, and even just for preventing them from tracking around invasive species is important because the higher quality habitat the birds have, the healthier they are and the less susceptible they are to disease. Um, so it's important for a lot of reasons. And also so we don't run into wars when we're doing our research, that's nice too. Um, we also have a big rodent project um, going right now. So we've been trapping for a long time on these trapping grids and assessing the, the effect of, on the rat population, seeing how much they actually um, prevent the rat predation. Um, and then also seeing the effects on the native plants because the rats eat a lot of native plants. And if we can prevent them from doing that, then the birds have more food too. So we have a couple of different grids with a bunch of traps and we're getting more this year to continue that. Um, but the big thing is birds, not mosquitoes, which we started with some other groups and eventually it's grown to include all these lovely organizations. Uh, it started in 2016 and it's been the driving force behind mosquito control, which is very important to um, saving these birds. And we really need all these organizations working together because there's a lot of red tape and, you know, um, logistic and budget factors that go into such a huge project in such difficult terrain to work in. And so there's a couple of different mosquito control strategies. I'm going to talk about the first one, which is um, IIT or incompatible insect technique. And so people a long time ago found that um, mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia um, bacteria the, the females um, and the males, when they um, when one of them is infected and they mate, then you get eggs that are inviable. They won't hatch. Um, so one of the things you can do here is normally you have the female and the male. The, the yellow is uninfected and they just find each other and mate, create lots of baby mosquitoes. But if you drop a ton of male mosquitoes, it's important that they're males because they don't bite. Uh, they just eat nectar, um, only the females bite, then the female's not going to be able to find the males that are healthy. They're just going to mate with the Wolbachia infected males and eventually produce um, eggs that can't hatch, and it'll really tamp down the population. And this has been shown in a lot of different areas. It's not like an experimental technique or anything. Um, the only experimental part for the Hawaiian Islands is seeing if we can get the right amount of mosquitoes in there and get them to disperse enough because of the weather and the conditions. Because what you have to do is drop these things from a helicopter in little pods. Um, it's not the easiest thing to, to do. Well, that's the main idea behind that. And that's been in the works for a long time. Um, we had to get permits um, of all kinds to drop, you know, live mosquitoes. If you know much about Hawaiian history, you know that things like um, the mongoose have been introduced and done horrible things um, and like killed a lot of native birds and so they really want to make sure that things aren't being introduced that are going to negatively affect the ecology so we had to do um, a lot of that um, a lot of uh, work with the public to um, make sure that people understand what's going on and that they're okay with it um, and eventually it's Maui forest birds actually um, is a sister organization on Maui and they were able to start their trials first so we learned from them and another big roadblock actually was the company there's like one company that raises all these male mosquitoes 
and they hadn't raised the so there's the genus Culex, which is the one that uh, has the avian malaria um, for this area, and they hadn't raised any mosquitoes in that genus. So it took them a while to figure out how they could produce enough for us to use. Um, so we did that. We did public comments, and we took all that into account and developed a strategy that we're rolling out this year, thankfully. Um, the other strategy is BTI, and so basically it's bacteria. People use this in agriculture. They'll spray it around. They'll spray it in neighborhoods. Um, it's another common thing where it only affects this one genus of mosquitoes, and what it does is the bacteria get in there and... Um, there's a protein that the larvae of the mosquitoes make that um, binds, that the bacteria bind with, and they create big cysts that rupture and kill the, the larvae, um, pretty much. Um, the BTI was found in soil a long time ago, um, and it's fortunately completely harmless to humans and other insects. So we have been spraying this um, in a lot of different places and doing a lot of monitoring to see how effective it actually is. Um, we have to do helicopter and like IIT, I should have mentioned this is IIT, you have to keep doing it kind of over and over. It's not a, um, a one-time solution because there's always more mosquitoes coming in. So you need to keep the population slow. And surprisingly, it can get into these little holes. Even the droplets are specifically formulated to be able to float around in the air and get into those holes. Um, and so we did our monitoring projects. Um, you can see here the, um, that's an adult mosquito trap, but it's next to um, some larvae cups. Um, and um, it, while it doesn't show like a super strong decline, you can see that um, the not treated area had a huge growth in the number of mosquitoes found per trap night. Um, but the the ones infected by BTI saw a small decline. So it was a pretty big influence. And traditionally what this does is not only does it target two different life stages of mosquitoes, but also you go and you spray the BTI and you knock down the population a lot to a level where you can add the infected male mosquitoes without um, at a rate where the, there's way more infected males than um, healthy males. And so we are combining these two this year in the spring and then in the fall to really reduce mosquito population, both on the plateau and in the source populations next to the plateau to make a difference. Now we also have ex situ conservation, which isn't, you know, what you want to do necessarily, but sometimes you need to. Um, and so we have um, collected a lot, you know, there's obviously a lot of permits as well that come with this to um, collect a bunch of birds and a bunch of eggs and make sure that they're all healthy and in good environments and release them as soon as possible when we identify an area where we can do that. Um, and so, as you can see, a lot of Akikiki eggs um, and most of them are still uh, alive. Obviously, when you have a new species, it's a learning curve on how to care for them properly. Um, so unfortunately, um, a few of the birds have died, but the populations are stable and even beginning to increase for Aki and Akeke um, in captivity. So hopefully we think we'll be in a place where we can grow the population even while we're waiting for the environment to be in the right spot to re-release them. Um, we also did adult collections um, by netting them. Um, we've seen a lot fewer um, adults by doing this. Um, this is another way to uh, monitor how many adults there are. Um, and we've seen a lot fewer, but fortunately we're, we're taking some as an insurance population. Um, another idea that we have had is um, translocating them to places like Maui. It's a newer island. It has a higher mountain, um, so it might be a better place. Um, a couple of concerns with this are eventually the mosquitoes are going to be able to get to those higher elevations too, so it'll be a temporary solution. And also, you know, reintroductions are always risky if it doesn't work out because it's not the exact same environment, then we just lost our insurance population. So um, there's a lot of work and a lot of modeling going into whether those environments are suitable and it's still under consideration. So summarize kind of what's next for us. We've got 
rat trapping to decrease rat density and the two-pronged mosquito um, control approach. We're also looking for the remaining Akikihi and Akikei to know where they are, protect those areas, and also to potentially collect if we need to do more of that. We're also monitoring um, Huayohi nests and which streams they um, prefer the best so we can focus our protection on those streams and also keep tabs on their population. And we're also this year doing a huge AKK survey where we're placing um, audio recording devices all over the swamp in addition to just listening for the birds. And so we're going to get a ton of great footage on what goes out there day and night. Um, and that's going to help us create even more specific strategies. So you might be wondering if there's anything you can do about this. Well, coming to this talk was already an amazing way to help out. Um, staying informed and involved is great. If, um, you know, we've started to make the news a little bit, but the more people that know about what's going on in this remote Pacific Island, um, the better. And so even if one of you, each of you told like three people and say, hey, each of you tell three people about this, eventually it'll expand and there'll be a ton of people who know about it. And so we call kind of building the aloha, like aloha can mean hello and goodbye, but it also can mean like love, <clears throat> love and caring. So um, just building some um, awareness of that. And then there's also things you can do like contacting governments by volunteering, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, and just generally supporting our efforts. So if you have any questions or if you want to know even more you can do, then just feel free to let me know. And I really appreciate your time. So thanks for listening. Mahalo. Well, thanks very much, Sam. Um, are you able, Sam, to see the chat? Um, yes. I just need to pull up the Zoom window. Just one sec. So he has to unshare and I have to unshare. Yeah, right? Yes. Okay, Sam, if you can unshare your screen and I'm doing the same. You don't have to share. Hmm? You're, not, you're not sharing. I'm not? Nope. Okay, great. All right, while well, we see if anyone is posting questions into our chat room here in our live audience, does anyone have any questions? Anne has a question. Okay, so uh, I found it very interesting, Sam, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I found it really interesting that you guys are trying to kill off mosquitoes when here on the continent, we're trying to encourage people to let the mosquitoes live because they're such an important food source for the birds. Um, are mosquitoes not a food source for the Hawaiian birds? Um, yeah, that's interesting actually, because mosquitoes aren't really an important food source. They were actually were only on the island after European contact, before there were no mosquitoes. Um, and so there are a lot of native insects that are, albeit understudied, um, that we would like to see fulfill those roles instead. Um, and so yeah, fortunately, we kind of have free reign to uh, knock down the population as much as we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else have questions? I can run this out. Any other questions? Any, any other questions? Sure. There's another live question coming to you, Sam, and then a couple in the chat. Yeah, Sam, I, I found your presentation really good. Um, excellent. Uh, Thanks. Of ETI, though, uh, is that not also targeting your moths and butterflies as well? Yeah, so the, the great thing about BTI is that the bacteria, um, so the way it works is that uh, I kind of glossed over this, but um, it produces a protein that um, binds with another specific protein that only this genus of mosquitoes produces. So in most species, even if it like gets into the insect itself, it's not really going to do anything. It's just going to be killed by the immune system or just hang out. But um, when it gets into this specific genus of mosquito larvae, um, those proteins bind and they form these big cysts that eventually um, rupture the gut membrane. So They've um, done, we've done trials on this um, in Kauai and elsewhere and other types of insects fortunately aren't affected. Thanks very much, Sam. Thank you. Okay. 
Yeah, I think we can move to addressing the questions in the chat. Are you able to see those? Yeah, so I'll just take them from the top. Um, studying the effects of tourism. Um, I'm about specific projects, we might have done some very early in the existence of uh, Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project, maybe in the early 2010s. Um, so there actually is um, hiking trails that kind of go pretty much to our camps, like way in, in where the bird habitat actually is. They're not very often used because they're not the best hiking trails, but people do go in and out. And there's also um, pig hunters who we see the most up there, um, who we've, you know, we've seen everywhere and their dogs running around. Um, and so people do worry that it's going to put like get uh, rapid ohia death, that fungus, into the forest. Um, but I think it also really helps with the pig population. So um, I'm not exactly sure, but the only places that the birds are are very protected and they don't see a lot of human traffic aside from the occasion of big hunter. So um, that's, that's most of the information I have on tourism. It would be nice if there was a lot more of um, the... Uh, ecotourism and being able to help out. We don't really have the capacity to manage a lot of volunteers personally, but other organizations do. Like I know the TNC and the DLNR um, have people volunteer for them all the time. Um, part of the thing with us also is we don't want to tell people necessarily exactly the location or show them where the Akikiki, Akikiki are because um, collectors will take those species for themselves sometimes because they're so rare. So got a little bit on tangent, but um, anyway, uh, the photo displayed on the what can you wait? Oh, that one um, here. I'll go back to it here. Those are mosquito larvae. So they have these um, like their mouths here that they filter feed, uh, or actually they have the filter and the um, breathing tube kind of coming off the tail. So they they hang out upside down and they use this little tube to breathe in their filter feeders. Um, and then this one. Uh, oh, sorry, I wasn't pointing at the right screen. Breathing tube going up, and they have a filter as well coming out the other side. And then you've got a pupa here. And so they stop eating and they turn into pupa, um, which just kind of hang out and swim around, and then eventually it'll hatch into a adult mosquito. Let's see. Um, thanks, Christopher. Um, Oh yeah, that was just a comment, sorry. Um, yeah, we're doing everything we can for sure. The most effective way to generate public awareness. Um, that's a good question. Um, these talks like this are really good and like getting big news stories out, um, you know, stuff like on National Geographic and things like that, that can, that can inspire a lot of people. They're pretty charismatic birds. And, and um, it's a pretty interesting situation. And then, you know, making sure that tourists that come are um, like see some of this stuff. There's a lot of so many visitors come to Hawaii. Um, that's pretty good. But one thing that we found also is that like a lot of local support can make a difference. Um, and so we've done a lot of local outreach education um, in schools and um, getting the community on board because a community conservation effort, I think, is usually um, the most kind of effective kind. Um, the government, uh, in terms of that, um, the government is actually where we get a lot of our funding from. It's pretty a pretty complicated structure. Um, so that definitely helps a lot. And we work with the government, the state, local, and federal government on um, conservation efforts. But of course, you know, more funding is always better. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the things that they can do. Um, the type of fungus that affects the feet of native birds that are unable to perch. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. So there was a picture that I had up here once that I think it was, I thought it was an example of a bird pox, but it could have been that foot fungus because it, it had taken over like a majority of the foot. Um, I don't think that's super prevalent on Kauai at least. Um, we haven't really noticed that. We take photos of all the birds that we catch in band, um, but it's definitely something to look at because these kind of pathogens can come out of nowhere. So um, yeah, that's definitely something to watch out for. 
Um, yeah, any other questions or anything like that? Are there any other questions here? No, there is a question here, Sam, one sec, I'll carry the microphone up. Cool. Uh, Sam, with the pigs, mm -hmm. um, Carr has been really good at, at uh, killing off various species. Uh, why have they been unsuccessful in eliminating or eradicating the pig populations on a relatively small island? You were saying hunters? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, species that we've hunted to extinction. Uh, yeah, hunters. it's ironic. <laughs> Do we know um, if it's 22 is anymore? <laughs> I think, yeah, really, I think part of it is um, the terrain, um, like these. We don't have like a topographic map or something up, but it's just incredibly dense vegetation. There's areas that are super, um, like super steep cliffs on either side that pigs can like go up and down, but a lot of times humans with other gear, like we'd have to be helicoptered in. So it's really difficult to get at the pigs and to know like exactly where the pig populations are because they can hide out there. Um, and I think the other thing is um, there's they can go in a lot of areas um, like even close to resorts where you can't hunt um, as often and uh, hunting isn't the same kind of thing in some places in Hawaii as it is on the mainland so like you know I'm from Montana I think it's the same in a lot of places in Canada um, where hunting is almost part of the culture and um, you know everyone learns how to do it. And, you know, they, they have to have a tagging system for some species because there's so many hunters. But with this, it's, it's really hard to hunt the pigs. Actually, one thing that a lot of the hunters do is they have a team of dogs that that finds it and encircles it. And then they use a knife instead of a gun. Um, I'm not sure if that has partially to do with the regulations in these protected areas, but it takes a lot of resources to be a pig hunter compared to other species. So I think those are a couple of reasons why. Uh, I see a question here in the chat about um, the effectiveness on rat traps. Um, actually, that's something I was just working on. Um, so we do see a decline in areas where there's traps. So we set up, what we do is we set up these tunnels with ink plates and paper. And so when the rats run through, uh, we can find, we see the rat tracks. And so we set those up in the trap grids. And then we also have grids um, close to the trap grids and then in other areas with tunnels, but no traps. And we found that there's usually lower amounts of tracks where there's also traps nearby. Um, and at the same time, we've seen a rise in rat tracks um, detected in areas where there's no tra traps. So we do think that it's having an impact um, however, it also depends on the type of habitat. Um, so uh, the traps are usually more effective in the streams and the plateau uh, in some situations um, for a variety of reasons, like maybe the, the rats have less of a choice of where to go, so they encounter the trap more often in the, the streams with the high walls. But um, yeah, they do a pretty good job. And so we're actually putting out um, like 25 to 50 more or something like that this summer. Wow, Sam, that was just a lot of fantastic information. Yeah, I big info that, dump. <laughs> I think that we've reached the end of our questions on this end. So just on behalf of Victoria Natural History Society, thank you so much for taking the time to present today. This was really interesting. And I hope we'll get to hear a great update from you in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to give you some good news at the end of the year or something like that. I really appreciate your time. So Thanks so much. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day in Kauai, and we will talk again. Have a good night. And to everyone else, thank you for your attendance, and good night. Good night. Good night.